right, so um, hello everyone. I'm Sven. I'm a software engineer at Facebook London. I'm going to talk about Foley Function, a non copyable alternative to standard function, uh, which I started working on a year and a half ago. Um, it's been modified, and different issues uh, have been fixed by some of my Facebook colleagues as well, uh, and should be in a pretty good shape now. Uh, I guess most of you, uh, being seasoned C++ developers, know about standard function, have used it before, so let me start with the TLDR for you. Uh, so Foley function is a replacement for standard function, which, unlike standard function, is not copyable. Uh, so it's a move-only type. Um, it is no except movable. And also, unlike standard function, it enforces correctly um, cons correctness. I'll go more into detail that, uh, about that, obviously, later. Uh, it's as fast or faster than standard function in terms of execution speed uh, and also compile speed uh, on the relevant platforms where we tested it. Um, it's been now in production use at Facebook for about 18 months, uh, so I can tell you a little bit about the experiences we've made. And if you want to have a look at it, you can check it out. It's part of the Folly, li Folly Library. Uh, which is Facebook's basically collection of useful things that we um, put together in a library uh, which you can get at GitHub. Um, right, in this talk, I shall tell you a little bit of a theoretical uh, introduction going from callable types to function wrappers, uh, but then I will tell you specifically about the problems that we had using standard function, which obviously led to the design decisions for folly function, so I'll tell you about that. Uh, and I will just tell you more about like what our experiences were was changing from one to the other uh, and during, like I said, the, the regular production use that we have seen now. Okay, so this theoretical introduction. Callable types in C++, uh, they include function pointers or function references, uh, obviously lambdas, and any class or struct that you define yourself if you define an invocation operator. If you happen to use a lambda that doesn't catch, uh, capture any data, or if you define to, um, uh, if you happen to define a member uh, function of your structure or class as static, uh, then those can all be cast into function pointers, and they are completely stateless, uh, which means that they are essentially just a pointer to the code that the uh, compiler generated. Um, but often, uh, you want to pass a little bit of data, a little bit of context with your callable object. So that would be in the case of a lambda, when you capture some data, and in the uh, code block that you define, you have access to that data, um, or in your struct or class when you define member functions or the invocation operator, as soon as it's non-static, uh, the code in here will have access to all the states of this class object. Uh, you can go one step further and define your lambda as mutable or your member function as non-const, and in that case, you only have access at the um, state in, in, in the sense that you can look at it, you can also mutate it. Um, all right, so what is this useful for? Um, so passing callables generally is useful. This is a like stupid uh, example. Um, if you were to have a function work that takes an integer and returns a string, and you want to code an asynchronous version of that, then you would probably code it in the sense that it takes the input parameters, and instead of returning the result right now, it will later invoke the little function that you pass it with the result when, it's ha when it has that. Um, the problem here when you, when you use this as your API, like I said, like a function point is very much stateless. So you give it a function process result, but that function will later only have access to like globally defined data variables. And usually when you do this, you want to pass a little bit of context with it so that the process results function later knows what a piece of work it was uh, getting the, the results from, something like that. Um, so a function pointer is not the best thing to use in this API. Um, if you, if you like, work with older APIs, you sometimes see that you would pass to work asynchronously also a void pointer that then later gets passed to your um, process result function, which is a uh, workaround around that. But void pointers are not good. They are, uh, they are not type safe and all that. So much better, we use a function wrapper. So instead of declaring your process result parameter as a function pointer, you use a function wrapper class, which is a template class. And the template signature is only the signature of the function, um, or more generally, the callable object that you mean. So anything that takes a standard string as an argument and returns void in this case, 
should be something that you can put into this function wrapper to pass it to your API. And I give you here like a super simplified version how you would implement such a function wrapper. <coughs> Uh, simplified and incomplete. But the idea is that your function wrapper will have to store some function pointers. Um, and while the, the type of the function wrapper itself doesn't say yet which kind of object you later wrap in it, because it only gives you the function signature, um, this is called type erasure basically. The magic happens when you define uh, templated construction, uh, constructors and assignment operators that can take any type and then instantiate some little bit of static code that can later run, um, take a pointer to the, to the state that you store, uh, probably on the heap or somewhere else in this function wrapper to execute your function. Uh, so it will populate a function pointer for execution in this data structure. And you probably need more. You probably also need a function pointer to something that can later on destroy the object when your function wrapper gets destroyed. OK, so this is super simplified. And this obviously exists in a more fleshed out version. And it's called standard function. So that's there already. What does a standard function look like uh, on our standard platform? Um, the GCC standard library on x86-64 usually has 48 bytes. Um, and 16 of those bytes are used for two function pointers, similar to what I just shown you. Uh, it stores a function pointer uh, for executing or invoking your object. And it's also a second function pointer for a little management function that it instantiates, which can copy uh, your object or can delete your object and so on. And all the remaining space, 32 bytes, can be used to store your actual object in the fun function wrapper itself. If it fits into 32 bytes, um, you can avoid uh, another heap allocation and just store it in place. If it doesn't fit in there, obviously, standard function will make a heap allocation and only store the pointer to your object on the heap inside this space as well. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, standard function is copyable. And when you make a copy of a standard function, it makes a copy of the wrapped object as well. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it's also not no except movable, um, which will become, uh, or the relevance of which will become clearer in a moment. OK, so typical use cases. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm working at Facebook, and we have a large code base using C++. So can I, look in, I can look inside and see like what our typical use cases is, how we use this. And the two things that I sort of see everywhere, the two classes of use cases, is either passing standard function as a little task to libraries for execution at a later time or in a different thread or something like this. And the other thing is to store those tasks for later execution, for instance, in the implementation of those libraries. In either case, you, you pass those tasks around, and typically they are only executed once uh, anyway. So there's very little reason why you need the standard function thing to be copyable for us. As a matter of fact, in, in those standard cases, there's, there's never the need to make a copy of them. Um, OK, I want to give you a little bit more detailed examples here, what it looks like. So in this Folly library, which is open source, so you can look at it and use it if you like, uh, we have an um, abstract base class, an interface called Folly Executor, which is basically an interface defining things that can execute tasks for you. So an implementation could be a CPU thread pool. So you pass tasks to this executor, and the thread pool executes it when a thread is available. <clears throat> and what we use is standard function void to pass those tasks around. Um, because Folly Executor is an abstract base class and this add method that you use to add a task is virtual, we can't use templates. We have to use a specific type. So the type that we use, obviously, is or was standard function. Um, to illustrate the other use case, in Folly, we also have uh, an implementation of the um, future and promise pattern, which you also know from the standard library. Uh, but ours is a bit more fleshed out and feature rich, and we couldn't wait or didn't want to wait until the standard library offers these features. Uh, so unlike the standard library, our future also has a dot then method where you can give it a um, little task that will be executed when your future actually has a value. Um, and the result of the dot then returns a future again for the result of your little lambda. So you can change them and all that. It's super useful, and we use this a lot, obviously. Uh, again, the implementation uses standard function to store the callback, 
because when you call dot then, the future typically doesn't have a value yet, so we store the callback, and later when the future has a value, can execute your little task. So that's all nice and well. What is the problem with standard function for us? Um, so the biggest problem was that we often wanted to use uh, move-only types and capture them in those little tasks. So typically, you would like to be able to store a unique pointer or a promise of this future and promise pattern uh, in these little tasks to make use of them. Um, the problem here is that when you store non-copyable objects in your Lambda, your Lambda itself becomes non-copyable. Um, and now this doesn't compile because this gets eventually converted into a standard function and standard function only works with copyable objects. So this will get you a compiler error, which is bad and people still want to do what they wanted to do, so they find workarounds. One workaround uh, was, this is the clean one, you just move your move-only object on the heap and use a shared pointer to refer to it. Shared pointers are copyable, obviously, even if your object itself wasn't copyable. So you can capture the shared pointer in your Lambda, use that. That works, that is fine to some degree, but it comes with uh, overhead. So it impacts performance because A, now you have always extra memory allocations to store every single object on the heap. And secondly, as you pass these things around, you have to increment and decrement atomic uh, reference counts which can also mess with your, with your caching and, it's, and, and all this. So this can have performance over it, especially because this sometimes we use in code that executes very often and has to be fast. So people came up with a different workaround, and this is a bit nasty. So there's a class in, in, in Folly as well. So like I said, you can look at it if you want. It's called Move Wrapper. It's a, it's a template class. And basically, it's a, it's a wrapper around an object of type T, and the move wrapper implements the copy constructor by moving the contained object. Um, this is bad because it breaks copy semantics. Making a copy of a move wrapper doesn't really give you two duplicate objects afterwards, but one valid object that received the object and one leftover empty shell. Um, you can think of fully move wrapper. If, if you were to put a unique pointer into a move wrapper, that's essentially the old standard auto pointer. And everyone loved that, so that must be a good idea, right? Um, so if you have any code that makes copies of objects and then assumes that it has two valid objects afterwards, it just breaks when you pass these things around. On the other hand, this doesn't come with the performance overhead of the shared pointer solution, so if you happen to know that your implementation never does that, it never has to make copies, then that kind of works. But the compiler can't help you enforce these things. Um, so at that point, we thought, like, okay, we need a different function wrapper to solve those problems. Re requiring that all callable objects that you store in a function wrapper to be copyable is painful for us. And for most of our use cases, it's not helpful, it's not useful, because we never make those copies. And if we did, it breaks anyway in our code base because people use this move wrapper thing. So basically what you want, the code from earlier, you just want this to work. This should compile and it should behave as expected. Uh, okay, standard function problem. There's another problem that wasn't maybe super um, obvious for us, but while we're at it, um, standard function also has a um, lax idea of constructness. So standard function is a function wrapper, and standard function itself has an invocation operator, and that is declared const, which means even if you only have a const reference to your standard function, you can invoke your object. But it's happy with taking objects that have to have non-const references to be called. So something that mutates a state when you call it, you just put it in a standard function, and now it looks like something that you can call without it mutating its state. This is not necessarily a bug itself. The problem is just like the compiler can't help you anymore when you do this wrong. Normally, const correctness helps you enforce, um, or enforcing const correctness helps you find those bugs and avoid those bugs. The compiler can't help you now. You have to make sure you write all code correct. So here comes folly function. Um, folly function, OK, um, how is it designed? Obviously, non-copyable. Why well, I say obviously. So the thing is, what we wanted is we wanted to be able to store non-copyable callables. Um, but we also want to do this without like bad uh, performance uh, impacts. So it shouldn't internally do the standard shared pointer trick, uh, 
because I said that leads to extra memory allocations and is, is uh, expensive and all that. And also it should maintain value semantics. You should think of it as a thing containing and owning an object and as you pass it around, you pass ownership of that around as well. Uh, so basically what that means uh, that the folly function, the wrap object itself, must also be non-copyable. Um, but that's fine because we hardly ever want to copy it. The other decision we made is it should be no except movable, um, which is kind of important for non-copyable types um, because you want to be able to use those types with STL containers and say standard vector, if it has to reallocate and move all your objects around, it will only use move semantics if move is guaranteed not to throw because it would be a problem if in the middle it throws and then what do you do, move the rest back? That might throw as well. Um, no, um, the standard containers would copy objects if they're not no except movable, which obviously is a problem if your object is not copyable. So it's, it's kind of like, if you think about it, um, non-copyable types really have to be no except movable. Um, and the other thing is that if you think about it, we expect many of our own classes to have fully function members. And if fully function wasn't no except movable, then it would be like kind of contagious. All those other data structures that contain fully function would become no except movable. And we rather want to live in a world where roughly everything is no except movable. Um, so yeah, that's what we decided for that. Uh, we also decided to make a const correct. And like I said earlier, standard function kind of makes the mistake, if you will, that it accepts functions that mutate their state but appears as a thing that does not mutate its state. And now you can choose whether you should go the way where the state should be mutatable, then you can accept anything, but you also need a const, non-const reference of your function wrapper to be able to call it. Or you go the other way and say everything is const. We only accept um, callables that do not mutate their state when we call them. And then it's fine that the folly function is also called as a const thing. Um, those are the two options, and we basically have both of them. So it comes in two flavors, the folly function template, uh, which takes the function signature here. You can add const at the end, and then it's the const behavior, otherwise it's the mutable behavior. Uh, implementation details, comparing with what I told you about standard function earlier. Folly function objects are a little bit larger. They occupy 64 bytes. Um, the implementation is actually pretty similar to how standard function works. So folly function also contains two function pointers, one that calls your actual object uh, and the other one that calls a management function for moving your object, deleting your object, etc. And then there's now 48 bytes left for in-place storage. Um, the reason why we made it a little bit bigger, I mean, this is a trade-off. The larger you make the wrapper, the more objects you can store in line without extra memory allocations. But the larger you make it, the more memory you just waste if you end up storing small objects in it. So it's kind of like you can, you can pick your size and we, we just came down on 64 bytes because it aligns nicely with like cache lines on our standard architecture. I think for a moment we also thought uh, 64 bytes is good because then we can store a standard function object if we, those, if, if we have so, those still lying around in our code base we can wrap this here without an extra memory allocation. However, that argument doesn't really work because like I said earlier, standard function is not no except movable. And in order to have folly function no except movable, we have to put all objects that are not no except movable on the heap because the pointer to the heap object, we can always move that without throwing exceptions, but we might not be able to th uh, move the object itself. Um, so yeah, uh, speaking of, um, wrapping one in the other of those two. Uh, you can absolutely wrap a standard function object in a folly function, but not the other way around. The reason is just the copyability requirements. <clears throat> uh, because folly functions are copyable, you can't store it in a standard function. Other way around works fine, which is a good thing as you migrate your code base and your APIs, um, it's, it's mostly kind of backwards compatible. If you change functions to take folly functions, they can still accept standard function passed to them. Okay, and then we migrated to folly function. Um, it, it works mostly as a drop-in replacement for standard function. Um, the places where it doesn't work as a, as a simple drop-in replacement are those where you actually need copyability of your function wrapper. Those cases are surprisingly rare. I, I really didn't find many of those. The other thing is if you rely on this lex 
const correctness behavior of standard function, then you might run into problems when you switch to folly function. But I think that is a good thing because um, if your code only works when const correctness is not enforced, then that's kind of a bug and should be fixed anyway. Um, what we also learned is of those two variants, the mutable and the const variant of folly function, um, most, in most cases we need the mutable one. Like all const folly function is used occasionally, but not very often. Um, and what I also saw when I was migrating APIs is that we often pass standard function as const references, um, which led to many sort of accidental copies uh, of standard function. Um, and what you have to do in order to make it work with folly functions, you have to pass them either as non-const references or as R-value references. Uh, most of the time it's R-value references because you kind of move them down your API layers. Um, this basically applies only to the mutable variant of folly function. If you have, if they have the const variant of folly function, then you can also pass it as a const reference, um, at least if you want to execute the function in the function that you pass it to. Um, anyway. Um, so migration has happened in many places. The adoption at Facebook is uh, such that in the examples that I showed you earlier for the APIs, uh, I showed you the um, Folly Future example. That is now based on Folly Function, and that was an instant win because no user code had to change, but from that time on, people could just move capture data in their lambdas, move only types as well, and it just worked. It compiled and it worked as expected. Uh, folly function uh, also replaced standard function for the other example, the folly executor, the space class um, where you can pass tasks to some implementations that execute the task later. Uh, that was a little bit more work because being a base class, we have a good number of implementations. So you had to go through all the implementations and see if you could just flip the, the type, whether the implementation would still work or whether copies were made, which usually were just accidental copies. It was just copies where people forget to write standard move, not copies they made because they actually wanted to have a copy. Um, and in those cases where the migration was actually non-trivial, it usually pointed to other problems in the code. Uh, for us, especially when you actually made copies of objects, that was a problem because other parts of the code base never expected that to happen, so they used this horrendous folly move wrapper thing. Um, but after all, it wasn't that difficult, really. Um, now we have both. We have standard function, we have folly function, and both can be useful. So when you have functions, when you have code that actually wants to get a function passed and will, will later have to make copies of that, standard function is exactly what you need. Uh, I would say in pretty much every other case, folly function is better because it's less restrictive for the user. If you don't need to make copies, don't force your user to give you something copyable. Um, well, um, and then the thing for our code base, that might not be the same problem for everyone, but because we have lifts along with standard functions and the problems, and we made these workarounds, and we used folly move wrapper as a workaround, we have this folly move wrapper now in many places in the code base. That makes it difficult to use standard function for its intended purpose, because if you use standard function with the intention to actually make copies, you might still into people passing you move wrapper objects and then copies are not possible at all. But that's, that's like maybe a prob problem specific to our code base. Um, all right, I should show you some benchmarks. So I, I said it was as fast or better in uh, runtime speed as Folly function. Um, so this is a benchmark. The benchmark code itself is also part of the Folly repository. So when you check it out on GitHub, you can rerun this yourself. And this is only a subset of the benchmark that it runs. But roughly speaking, the upper half, you, um, what is compared here is invoking a function, invoking a function pointer, invoking a standard function, invoking a folly function, uh, standard memory, if you're interested. And basically, the important thing is just, uh, ah, wrong button. It's just this here. Invoking a standard function takes 2.3 nanoseconds. Invoking a folly function takes 2 nanoseconds. So it's even slightly better. And then there's another benchmark which first creates one of those objects and then invokes it. So creating a function pointer doesn't really take any time. Uh, so I guess that's probably a, a little me measurement error here that it's slightly faster. But then creating a standard function object and afterwards uh, invoking it, 
Uh, ah, there we are. Takes three nanoseconds. I was off by one line. Um, takes three nanoseconds for standard function and for folly function, 2.8 nanoseconds. So it's not really that important that it's faster. It was only important for us that we don't like invent a performance regression. Um, and that's obviously not the case. All right, uh, conclusions. All the things that I've said before, for the function is mostly drop-in replacement for standard function. Uh, it lifts the requirement for copyability of your wrapped objects. Uh, the migration to volley function is usually fairly easy, makes the code look nicer in many places. Um, it enforces constructness, which is good because the compiler can help you spot bugs. Uh, it's as fast or better as standard function at runtime. And after 18 months, we are pretty happy, I guess, at Facebook with it. Uh, with that, I thank you all for coming, and I think we probably have a few minutes left for questions, if there are any. I have one question about const. Mm -hmm. um, what does const mean for a callback? Does it mean that the callback object itself is const? Um, so const... I don't know if this is now more confusing or helpful, but um, it's basically the const that you would put here in your own function. So const means that you can't mutate the state that you have packaged with your callable object. So in a Lambda, when you capture some data, you can't change that data. Unless you declare the Lambda mutable, then you allow it. And the mutable Lambda uh, is not const can't be wrapped as a const thing, uh, whereas the non-mutable lambda is, is const and is fine. Okay. It's basically the object with the operator callback, right? Uh, yes. Basically, const means that your object can be invoked from a const reference. If it's non-const, you need a non-const reference to your object to actually call it. From what I see from your migration from uh, suit function to uh, poly function, uh, you don't have any ABI problems at Facebook, or how did you manage that? Um, I don't want to say zero. Um, there's always the odd case where there's like a little chain of things where you where you see that you don't have to change one API, but like sort of a dependency chain of APIs, and at some point it gets maybe complicated. But like in general. It just turned out to be easier than I thought, as, as in, in general, in most places, it was a fairly one-to-one -one replacement. And the most things I had to change, and for example, it's implementers of this executor class, were that people were uh, not careful and making copies of the tasks, even though they didn't have to, just because they didn't write standard move, and that, that kind of thing. So just swapping the type broke the build, but that was super easy to fix. And in the few cases where it wasn't trivial to fix, it was really pointing to an underlying problem, I would say. So, I think the question was about binary. Yes, ABI. Oh, ABI. sorry. Yeah. Uh, so say that again then. So my question was, given the way you migrated from the two function to poly function, oh, I get you. Oh, I get you. You don't have any ABI problems, so I'm just wondering what okay. is, how do you build and deploy your software? Yeah, that's more like a workflow thing. We we basically statically link everything and build everything from current master, so it, it didn't have to be binary compatible. Good point, I never thought about that because working in Facebook and linking everything statically, I never had to. So yeah, thanks for the question. Um, this is an implementation detail. I wondered what the management function pointer was for instead of the wrapper. Okay, so um, this is somewhat an optimization thing as well, so basically, um, the code that the compiler has to instantiate separately for every type that you want to wrap in it is obviously invoking your object, but then in standard function, you have to be able to make a copy of that object when the standard function itself is copied. You have to be able to destroy the object when, um, well, when the standard function is destroyed. Um, standard function also has a couple of other things that we never needed, like getting a type ID from the wrap type and, and things like this. And they basically bundled everything that is not invocation into one function so that you don't have to store that many function pointers in it. And it's like, the trade-off is like, okay, invocation is the standard use case, that should be fast, so we have a dedicated function pointer in the object to quickly execute the function. 
Everything else are operations that don't happen so often, so we bundle them all into one function, so we only have to one, store one function pointer. If that makes sense. <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> Where that function comes from. Is that another oh, argument that you have? No. Um, so think of it um, in the implementation of, of the assignment operator and the constructor that can take any, any type. Basically, there the compiler instantiates some other templated static functions and stores their function pointers. Uh, so it's the compiler doing the work for you for every type that you ever pass to those function wrappers. Uh, I get a session is over sign. There was like half a question, is it really quick? I want to know if you use like multiple functions or you have this uh, Frankenstein function that, so you store only the one function pointer and this Frankenstein function. So you mean this management function? Yeah, management. So function. the point, is, um, the, the, the question is whether Folly function does the same trick with this uh, bundled function that does various management functions. Yes, the implementation is, fairly similar to standard, standard function. It's really just the decision. You have to decide whether your type is copyable or not, and we made a different decision, but we kind of use all the same tricks as standard function in the implementation otherwise. All right, session's over. Thank you all very much for coming.